have you introduced? <laughs> All right. Here at six o'clock, I want to remind those folks that are joining us on the Zoom to please remain muted unless you're called upon to speak. Um, we do have a couple people in the waiting room. Jessica, if you could let them in, please. All right, and for those of you joining us here in the council chambers, if you uh, have a cell phone, would you please put it on mute or vibrate or whatever so that it doesn't ring during the meeting? And for the folks joining us on the Zoom, I'll just reiterate now that the others have been ad admitted from the waiting room uh, to please keep yourself on mute unless you're called upon to speak. All right, are we all ready? Common Council of the City of Glendale is now in session. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask Chief Ferguson if he can lead us in the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. Roll call, please. Mayor Kennedy? Here. Alderwoman Wuka? Here. Alderman Doherty? Here. Alderman Gelhard? Here. Alderman Bailey? Here. Alderman Schmelzling? Here. And Alderwoman Shaw? Alderwoman Shaw actually reached out this afternoon. She has to work late, so okay. she has to be excused. You have a quorum. All right, thank you. Um, first item uh, tonight is a county board briefing. Uh, we've invited County Supervisor Ann O'Connor, who represents about 75% of Glendale, to come and introduce herself. Um, we, I know she has to be in an event at Whitefish Bay at 6.30, so she's the very first item, and I think she's just going to take a couple minutes just to introduce herself and talk about uh, what's going on at the county board in the last, what, three weeks? <laughs> three weeks, the last to report. Yeah. Um, so more of an introduction, really. My name is Ann O'Connor, and I am your newly elected supervisor representing District 1. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet with some of you, and I wouldn't be sitting here at all if it weren't for Alderperson Bukovic. So it's really great to meet and see all of you. I'm making my way from um, municipality to mis municipality. I represent six of them, um, just making introductions and uh, making myself available to you with your uh, questions and concerns. As elected officials, you have a different viewpoint, um, obviously key stakeholders in our communities. So I firmly believe in just building out those relationships so that we can work together well. Um, in terms of updates from the county, I can tell you which committees I've been placed on and they haven't even met yet. So I will be on Intergovernmental Relations Committee as well as Finance. Um, but I also have a special interest in parks and climate and equity. Uh, as well as housing. So those will all be things that I'll be paying very close attention to. Um, and again, just want to re re reiterate my doors open. My email for anyone in the room at all is anne.o'connor at milwaukeecountywi.gov. So um, look forward to working with all of you. And thank you for the welcome, Mayor Kennedy. And all. Thank you. Thank you. Ask any members of the council have any questions. Alderman Vukovic. I would like to clear up uh, very quickly. Um, you would have had me if she had her <laughs> answer. I don't think you want me. This is we should give her a round of applause for, for running because you didn't want me over there, that here and there. It's too much. I thank you, Anne. You are definitely a pillar in our community. I know you're from Whitefish Bay. We'll we'll let that go. Um, but you have Stop been Glendale. <laughs> yeah, you're adapted Glendale, but you have done so much work within the seven um, uh, shore, North Shore communities as well as Milwaukee. And the one thing that really put it over the edge is when you did not have to work on a piece of legislation, you went to different um, county supervisors on your own free will to push something that was going to be helpful for all of our community. And you did it without having a title. You did it without having an alderman or a county supervisor seat. You were just a citizen. That's where I knew that I would your support and the what you were going to do was going to make a great difference for our community in District 1. Half of my district is um, someone else. I am in your district. So thank you for being my representative. Your very kind words. I appreciate that so much. And you're referring to the advocacy work that I've done. So I appreciate that. I am a 
a co-founder of an organization called Bay Bridge in Whitefish Bay, and we advocate for social justice, making the North Shore more welcoming and normalizing conversations around normalizing conversations around race. And in that capacity, we have been part of the redress movement to redress segregation in the area. Uh, we've worked on housing issues, um, and those are some of the things where I had already appeared in front of the county board at advocating for resolutions, including um, one that recognizes the restrictive covenants that still um, live on our property deeds all throughout the county. So that was part of um, what was being referenced there, and I really appreciate that and your very kind words. Thank you. I'd like to make one other comment. Yes, I know um, you were were not running opposed, but you still made it a point. I know at least for me to reach out and ask what's important to my constituents. So, and that was when you were running. So, um, glad to see you here with the continued outreach, and it's a great start. So, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I really mean that I value everyone's input because like I said, you have a different point of view and you're highly vested and you are the people that have also, you know, raise your hand, come forward. So I just think we can be really productive in building those relationships and cooperate to make our region the best it can be and help Milwaukee County fulfill its goal of being the healthiest county by achieving racial equity. So I look forward to working with everyone. Questions from any? Thank you. I said we'd try and get you in and out of here in about five or six minutes so you could make it to your That's next it. event. I'm off to the Whitefish Bay Garden Club President's Dinner, so thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks, Supervisor O'Connor. All right, so the uh, the next item is actually kind of a bittersweet one, and it is uh, a recognition of Mark Ferguson for his 39 years of service to the city of Glendale. Uh, Mark has been a police officer for 39 years. Every single one of those days he's been in the city of Glendale, uh, former president of the union, and um, has been a sergeant, a lieutenant, a captain, and what has for the last five and a half years been the police chief for the city of Glendale. Um, has, uh, I think, exhibited exemplary service to the city of Glendale and has made our department uh, a state and national leader we are one of only 37 departments in the state that have achieved full accreditation, um, when, and that's a, a really high bar. Um, and he also um, volunteers his time helping other departments become accredited. Um, I received a wonderful letter from uh, Waukesha for some work that uh, Chief Ferguson did. Uh, so we have a proclamation that uh, all of us will end up signing, and but luckily today's not your last day, so we have time for all of us to sign it, get it in a frame, and we'll present it to you uh, before you leave at the end of the month. But the proclamation reads, uh, now therefore be it proclaimed that it is appropriate to honor Mark Ferguson for his 39 years of dedicated public service, and be it further proclaimed by the Mayor and Common Council that the City of Glendale does hereby acknowledge um, with sincere appreciation and gratitude, the service of Chief Ferguson to the community and thank him for his 39 years of service to the Glendale Police Department and the residents of the city of Glendale. So first I would like to ask uh, for a motion to uh, adopt the proclamation. So moved. Thank you, is there a second? Second. By Doherty, seconded by Gelhard. Now we're in a period of debate and discussion. I'm gonna open up to members of the council to embarrass the chief by telling all your wonderful stories about the chief. So. I'm, we'll just go ahead and start with number one, because you've served with him. Like, you're going to go last? Okay, number two. I had a chance to take the CPA class, which is, gives you a chance to get an inside view of the police department recently. And it was absolutely incredibly well run by, by all the officers I've met and the people I got to ride with and everything. But it really reflects, and I think really what Mark's built shows up in that kind of experience when you're close to get a chance to be up close and personal with all the officers and Mark hats off really ran you really built and been involved with for a long time but have continued and really strengthened a very good and police department with just wonderful folks in it and I can't say enough thanks for all you've done and your calm guidance on council has been also <laughs> nice so thank you very much for everything hard so well, I've been on the council for about 10 years now and, and since uh uh, chief Ferguson has been the chief. He has always, always uh, responded uh, promptly to any inquiries I had of him uh, and helped me out uh, in terms of uh, placing the, the, the speed signs where I, I wanted them. Uh, I think it's it's been uh, very helpful in my district. Uh, 39 years, uh, that's a tremendous achievement, Chief. Uh, congratulations. 
I would um, have to agree as having taken the CPA class as well, that um, it was an incredible insight to a extremely well, well run um, division and then have to give all credit to the chief and um, thank you for being extremely welcoming to the newest council member. Um, and uh, um, uh, yes, 39 years is an, an incredible amount of service and, and thank you for all your, um, your service. Number five. I, I have, um, I just look at what we have as our police department and I see so much of what Chief Ferguson has developed as a level of respect for our communities. Um, I think that I remember one of the most telling moments it was just, you know, secondhand. I was I was listening to a, a, a police scanner during um, some of the uh, post COVID, um, you know, Black Lives Matter type matches, marches and just the, the calm, the steady, the like just embracing of the feedback is, is just what I think is amazing for what I've seen from um, a true leader of our community. So um, thank you for all the time you've served. I don't know how um, those shoes will be easily filled, but great that you've us. All right, number one. You sat next to him. You call him Chiefy. <laughs> <laughs> to my Chiefy, I have uh, I have given all of our chiefs a nickname. TC was TC. Um, he has been Chiefy for me. Um, uh, this is a little bittersweet for me, and I I think that somebody who is a council member wouldn't be like a little bit emotional about it. But for this one, it it really is emotional for me because. I have worked with him so hard. We have argued, we have fought, we have um, agreed to disagree. And all of that, there was always a mutual respect. I mean, um, he has taught me to look at things in the eyes of the officers. And then I think I have showed him um, out of the eyes of black and brown people or people are coming and him really looking at department and saying, what can we retrain? Our department has great guys, but you know, maybe we need to retrain on something else. I feel I am losing a friend, not just my chief. Um, I still think we paid him way too much. He, I, I think he, we need to pull some of his retirement back so he can stay a couple extra years. Uh, oh, <laughs> um, I have, uh, I've I've worked really hard. He was supposed to retire in December, and then he was supposed to retire, and 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 I tried to push it to next December, but it didn't work. But from the bottom of my heart, I think that I am losing a friend. Glendale is um is is losing one of the most amazing chiefs in the state of Wisconsin because I've heard it from other people, not just. It, Glendale. It, it's not just our people. It's some of the, I was on the League of Municipalities and for a, a board for a long time. And they talked about how great our chief was in our police department. Um, this is one of the um, bittersweet moments that I will have. So I am going to make sure I get his, uh, his cell phone so I can and talk to him and, and make sure that he remembers me and call him all the time. Lastly, I thank the chief for guarding my own daughter. Um, she has changed her t attitude towards policing um, just because the chief answered questions for her. Um, there is not many chiefs that will individually answer somebody's question, just a regular random kid. Uh, I really, really am ups uh, a little emotional about this because who's going to sit and I know we'll get a great chief, you know, another great chief, but this I believe is a friend and a person who has helped me see the light of um, certain um, uh, issues that police have to go through, but he's also opened his eyes to things that black and brown people have to go through and has tried to make a difference in Glendale that now I do here in Milwaukee, we don't mind from black and brown people. We don't mind going through Glendale anymore. We're not scared. If we do get stopped, it's because we did something wrong or we are intention. You know, it's not that, you know, I'm just scared because I'm a black or brown person. And I think that is the department and his leadership and 
taught. So I am, I, I know I'm long-winded on this one, but um, thank you, Chief, for, for being here. Um, I don't know if anybody else could have sat by me for this long <laughs> and, uh, and, and and kept sanity. Sorry, Jim. But, yeah. Jim's Thank got you. to sit by you longer, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's not retiring at the end yeah. of the <laughs> Um, I just want to echo some of the rest of the comments that were made. And I just want to add that I think the thing that has stood out the most to me in your tenure as chief was in the summer of 2020 when there was a lot of racial unrest in the county and there were marches everywhere. And um, and you handled things differently in our community than other communities. And um, you 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 respected people's First Amendment rights to protest, but you also had created an environment in which people they could come into the city, move through the city and out of the city. And there was a mutual respect there even as well. Uh, we had leaders in the black community come out that summer and sit there in, in front of us and say that um, no other suburban police department operates the way Glendale does. And that really, that really struck me to have Senator Taylor and others here make those comments. And it was funny, I, I had reached out to the chief right as the protest started and uh, I said, I go, what, I go, just be prepared. I go, well, what kind of reforms could we do or, or you know, what kind of changes could we make? And the chief said, well, there are these national standards called eight can't wait. He goes, but I've already done them all. Yeah. He had already done them. Well, we didn't have the body cameras yet, but 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 we were but it was already in the budget works, right? He had already he'd already done them all or had them in the works. And so that that truly impressed me. So well, um, Chief, before we vote on this, is there anything you would like to say to us now? Well, I, I'd like to thank everybody for all their kind words. Um it has been a little pleasure a pleasure working here for over 39 years. There's been a lot of changes from when I started, not only with the city, but in policing. Um, and it's nice to hear the nice accolades, but I, I can't take any real credit for it. The credit is with the men and women back there. Um, you're only as good as, as your people. And we've made an effort over the years to try to hire really good people. They do an excellent job. They do the work that makes me look good. So in this case, I like to thank all of them for all the stuff that they've done because they are exceptional people. Um, I think we have an excellent department. That's one thing I will brag on is I think we are one of the, the better departments um, in this region, uh, maybe throughout the state. I really believe that. Um, and that's all because of the people that we have coming in and working and the support that we get from the city and the council. Um, obviously, uh, without you guys, we can't do our job. And so I think it's a really great relationship and I'd like to thank you, every one of you here for all the work and support that you've given us and the men and women back there that go out and do the job every day. So. So uh, with that, I will call for a vote uh, and I'm gonna ask actually that this be uh, recorded in the minutes because I'm gonna ask for a vote by acclamation. All in favor, aye. 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 And I'm not gonna call for any opposed. Um, so uh, proclamation is approved by the council and we truly appreciate your service and we will uh, try to get together with you to do a, a photo with the proclamation before your last day at the end of the month. So that's great. Yeah. I, and we are planning to have something on my last day from in the early afternoon. So uh, you'll all get an invite for that. So hopefully you can make it then. So that that be happens to be the same day my daughter graduates in oh. Massachusetts. So we got to get <laughs> okay. together and do a picture we before your last day. Okay, <laughs> yeah. flexible. Yeah. Uh, there's somebody that wants to say something. Well, we're actually at public comment. So, sir, if you'd like to come up to the microphone and say your name and address, we're at the public comment period where Glendale residents, business owners, and property owners are invited to speak to the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda. But go ahead, sir. My name is Al Simon. I live at 6697 North Green Bay Avenue in Glen Point 2. And I have been a citizen of Glendale for more years than Mark has served in law enforcement. This is a totally unexpected extemporaneous comment. I feel that I can't be in the room without making a comment. My military background was law enforcement. I'm highly sensitive to the work that 
police departments, policemen in the field, and the men that run them are doing. Because I've lived in Glendale for so long, and now at Glen Point too, we have had moments in which we have needed a department to come and visit us. Sometimes it's emergencies, sometimes it's concern of things we have seen. And I have made myself available when possible to every officer that has visited our little 10 family community at Glen Point too. I find them so exceedingly kind and thoughtful and, and concerned about our welfare. I can't even begin to tell you what it has meant to us. I have found stray dogs that I've taken in and they've come there and brought things to make sure that the dog, the owner is found. Mark, I just want to congratulate you and tell you that as a citizen of Glendale, we are proud of our department and pleased to have you all these years working on our behalf. Thank you. And I, I think it's a testament. You've got a dozen officers. You know, I, I sent something to the union president a couple of days ago, and you have a dozen officers here tonight. I think that's a real testament to your leadership as well. So, all right. Well, um, Chief, thank you. And we will schedule a time to do a, a photo op and everything with the proclamation once everyone's had a chance to sign it. All right. Thank you. And thank you to all the officers who took time out of your schedule to come out and join us soon. All right, the next item on the agenda then is public comment. So uh, we've now heard from Mr. Simon. Anyone else wanting to speak in public comment to a non-agenda item? Mr. Hess, did, um, Mr. Uh, Alderman Schmelzing said that you were coming out to speak about a non-agenda item, or did you want to speak or not? Okay, all right. Just wanted to make sure, didn't want to, didn't want to move on without giving you the opportunity, so. If there's um, anyone joining us on the Zoom that wants to speak in public comment, you can unmute and state your name and address. All right, we will move on then to the consent agenda. The consent agenda has four items. Um, it is uh, adoption of the minutes held on April or last meeting, which was April 17th, accounts payable, uh, proclamation for National Bike Month, and then a recommendation from the Legislative Judiciary and Finance Committee, which met right before the council meeting. Um, no, sorry, this was for the last time they met, the change agent for Metro Market um, at 6969 North Port Washington Road. Sorry, that's not for this one. It's from the last uh, L&J meeting. So can I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda, please? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Gelhard, or for, moved by Gelhard, seconded by Bailey. Um, any discussion? Okay, we'll consider the consent agenda approved without objection, and we will move on to the public hearing. Uh, we have a public hearing that was noticed on 6655 North Green Bay Avenue. This is the uh, former Silver Spring House um, site to be rezoned from an R7 residential to a B4 office research service business. And I will turn it over to the city administrator to give support before we open the public hearing. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kennedy. Uh, yeah, this is a very um, simple um, public hearing to, to change the um, use um, proposed uh, at the uh, Silver Spring House from R7 to B4. It is consistent with the 2040 comprehensive plan. Um, so that is really the extent of the overview on this one. Okay. And that has been an R7 residential district for as long as we've had zoning, despite the fact that the Silver Spring House actually predates the founding of the city of Glendale and operated as a restaurant in a residential district as a non-conforming use. That is correct. Okay. So it's just now a matter of, of changing it over. Okay. Uh, any questions from any members of the council before I open the public hearing? All right. The public hearing now is open on 6655 North Green Bay Avenue being rezoned from an R7 residential to a B4 office research and service business district. Anyone in the council wishing to speak in the public hearing is welcome to approach the mic and state your name and address. Oh, 
Residents, any any resident who wants to speak in the public hearing is welcome to come up. So, yep, and the public hearing is open. Oh, I'm here for having to tell. Yeah. Okay, could you just move the microphone so that when you speak, it you're stuck directly into it so that it picks you up? Otherwise, the folks listening on sure. the Zoom can't hear you. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so. Right next door to the restaurant is a 10 family condominium called Glen Point Two. Unlike the woman that sat in this chair, I have a title and it's why I'm here. I serve as the president of the association. In the room with me, I don't know if they'll be speaking. All the officers are here, our treasurer, our um, secretary and vice president. We are a very small, close community, 10 families, five buildings. And I never wanted to be president, but it got forced upon me when all three presidents left Wisconsin and moved to Florida. And there I was left with it. So I wanted it for one year and I'm now in my fifth or sixth year, I've lost track. So there are concerns. They're probably nothing you wouldn't expect. We're wondering if there are plans to add additional structures on the property. We're wondering if there are plans to alter um, the parking structure in some way. We wanna know what's gonna happen with the volleyball court that might be the only item on that property that every once in a while is an intrusion to our peace and quiet. And we wanna know what it means when you call the property a dental clinic and a spa, and what does it mean that you have a dental clinic that is a spa? Those are at least the things I have brought. Perhaps the other officers have a few more, but. So I, I can address those based on the, the this has already been to the plan commission and it's already been reviewed and sent Thank back. You. So uh, there there are no plans for any additional structures whatsoever. Uh, the volleyball court is not a part of the future use, so I believe it will be removed. Um, their uh, parking on the property is more than sufficient. Um, unlike living next to a restaurant, which might have had loud music playing and sporting events and all sorts of things that would have disturbed the peace, uh, this dental clinic and spa is quiet. Essentially, when you walk in, one side of the building will be a dental clinic and the other side will be a spa where there will be very, very soft music and people getting massages and nails done and stuff like that. So it's not going to be um, it, it will be a much quieter neighbor than what you had in the past. So and, I, and let me make sure the portion that's the spa is within the current building itself. Yeah, the current building is quite large. I don't know how many yeah. thousand square, it's like 4,000 square feet or 5,000 yeah. square feet. Yeah. And they don't need that much for either one of these two. Very but good. the person who has uh, this actually bought a historic building in Madison and turned it into a clinic and a spa, just like the one they're doing here. So she's buying a historic building and fully restoring the building. So the Silver Spring House, when it's done, will actually look nicer. And inside will be fully brought up to code. Um, <laughs> so, um, and, and like I said, I mean, you'll have cars that will come and go, but yes, no, no drinking, no, uh, no loud mu music, no sporting events or anything like that. I, I think I could almost answer the next question, but I want to put it out to you. Those of you who are familiar with Glen Point Two, Mark, you would be, you might have visited us once in a while in the 40 some years. We have a beautiful open space there. We who live on the southern end of it, we look out into these fields and we see the natural terrain. There are all manner of deer and birds and coyotes. And we have the pleasure when my grandchildren come here and they see these things, they think I live near a zoo. I mean, it's really, we love it, okay? I take it that there's no plans to interfere with the vista that we are enjoying in those open fields. 
There, there are not. And actually, in order to move forward with any sort of development in that that back part of the property would require going through the DNR and doing significant environmental studies, because sure. as you know, a lot of the area there to, to the west and north of you uh, was at one time Fox Point's landfill uh, 100 years ago. Yes. And so any building that would have to that would take place there would take several years worth of environmental studies. And the person who's purchased the Silver Spring house has no intention of investing. She's already investing in the historic, you know, um, a renovation of the building. She has no intention of going through that process of she actually likes the fact that it's very quiet behind there. So um, and was very clear with that about that when she spoke with us. So. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Valdeman. There's actually, if you look at the, I'm sure you're aware of this, but depending on where you are on Glen Point 2, um, Steve Schmelzing, your alderman, by the way, hello. Um, there's a, a parcel that was the Fox Point parcel. There's also the parcel that I believe is actually um, owned by Windsor Place. And then there's the parcel that is kind of the spring house. And I'm not aware of any additional development they're planning on doing at the spring house location back there. So I think they're keeping the same footprint. So nothing else would be happening back there. Um, Windsor Place, they're pretty established. They're not going to probably mess with anything in the back. And then um, there has been some potential discussion if we were to move forward with that portion that was Fox Point, but it'd be very trail. It would be still very fitting to kind of a park setting if that ever were to move ahead because it's prohibitive to do much else with it because of its prior landfill use. So well, I want I want to make a I didn't expect this but I want to make a comment it's a very unusual configuration mm -hmm. that we find in my backyard <laughs> as I move to the edge of it I'm in Fox Point. Actually, you're in the city of Glendale, but you're on a parcel of property owned by Fox. That is right. <laughs> and you know what? That happened to be an advantage to us living in Glendale because I also have a background in insurance and real estate. <laughs> Trees were leaning toward our condominium complex. And when I found out that Fox Point those trees were on Fox Point land. We reached out to Fox Point. They came over and I said, look, look at these trees. One of them comes down on this house. You will regret for decades the cost that it, because you didn't take them down. It took them two years, thousands of dollars. They had to budget just for that. And they took down like nine trees. So. We're so happy that Fox Point <laughs> is right, our neighbor, and it worked out well. So, Thank you. Do you have any other questions for us or any other comments? I wonder if Peter or Marie has anything. They're shaking their, they're shaking their head no. Okay, well, we welcome this development and are relieved that the land is going to be preserved. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in the public hearing? Is there anyone joining us on the Zoom that wishes to speak in the public hearing about the rezoning of 6655 North Green Bay Avenue? If so, you can unmute, state your name and address. All right, second call. Anyone wishing to speak in the public hearing? And third and final call, anyone wishing to speak in the public hearing? All right, I'd entertain a motion from a member of the council to close the public hearing. Moved by Alderman Schmelzing, seconded by Alderman Vukovic. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor um, of closing the public hearing, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Public hearing is now closed. Uh, we have before us a zoning map amendment for 6655 North Green Bay Avenue that will rezone it from an R7 residential to a B4 office research service district. Can I get a motion to approve the rezoning? Moved. Move Balderman Schmelzing. Is there a second? Second. Second Balderman Gelhard. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Rezoning is approved. Thank you for coming out tonight and expressing your, your comments. Appreciate that. I'm also happy the project meets the uh, the satisfaction of the neighbors. So.
All right. We'll move on now to our new business. The first item of new business is approval of a proclamation honoring municipal clerks appreciation week. I'll turn it over to the city administrator. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kennedy. We wanted to recognize uh, Megan and our hard clerks that work here at the city to help us put on our elections and do licensing like we had on the agenda tonight. Uh, so May 5th through 11th, 2024 was uh, National Clerks Week. So the um, enclosed proclamation would recognize uh, Professional Municipal Clerks Appreciation Week in 2024. So Megan, I know you're at home. Thank you very much for all that you do for us. All right. Yes, thank you, Megan. We're all applauding for you. All right, can I get a motion then to adopt the proclamation, please? So moved. All right, moved by um, Alderman Bailey and seconded by Alderwoman Vukovic. Um, I did have just one question. It says dated the second day of May 2020. Uh, okay, so you said next year, you meant this year. Yeah, 2024 was. It, it was, so I signed was, the proclamation like. You week, did, yeah. Almost two weeks ago. Correct. Because we didn't we didn't have an extra meeting in there. That is correct. Right? So, yep. okay. Yeah, that yeah, is so, a weird. Yeah, I can actually do proclamations that's within the mayor's authority, but I do bring them before the council, if nothing else, than to tell you about them. But in this particular case, it was so that you could all vote on um, approving them so that Megan hears the uh, the approval and the acclamation from all of us on the council. So, all right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor of adopting the proclamation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Proclamation approved. All right, the next item is petitioner's notice of taxation and bill of costs and an amount not to exceed $8,566.45 in the case of Rob Cromwell versus the city of Glendale. Mr. Warwick? Uh, Attorney Bear will handle this. As we previously, As we previously discussed, um, this is the amount uh, that the city is required to pay in final resolution of the uh, lawsuit relating to the open records request associated with the liquor license application. Thank you. At, because we were obligated by court order to pay it, it doesn't require us to move or second it. You're just reporting back to us, correct? Just reporting. Okay. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Curious. I see it listed as a budgeted expenditure. Do we really budget for these types of lawsuits or is this something that more we've had to tap into our other funding to cover? We yeah. budget for legal fees. Yeah, go, go yeah, ahead. I simply listed it as a budget expense because that's the amount of expense that we'll have to pay out in the budget to, to fund this. Okay, thank you. We do allocate money for legal fees, you know, that includes essentially all of Nathan's time or if we do outside legal counsel as well, they come out of that. Right, understood. Yep. No. I just didn't know if we had a certain amount that we plan for settlements, but I'm assuming not. No, we don't. All right, any other questions, comments? All right, we'll move on. The next item is the 2024 snow and ice control summary. Uh, so, Mr. Emig will come up and provide a summary. Let's hope it doesn't snow for the next six months. <laughs> All right, I would promise to be brief, as the snow season was this year. But I'm pumped. Um, for past you, Mother's Day, the last, the latest I've seen snow in the 25 years, uh, 24 years I've lived in Wisconsin was on Mother's Day Kansas. weekend. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um all right we, we should be good it was what 80 degrees yesterday so i think i think we'll be okay but it's just i'm gonna do a quick kind of cursory just review of this um we've already approved the, our uh, amended snow and ice operation last uh, recently so we've been working off of that um again we had less events this year than last season but again they're more impactful i think each time we have them um again we're more prepared with our um with our brining that we're doing ahead of these storms and feel like we're really providing a good service to the community. So um, basically, again, we're, we're making more brine. That's that's huge. I mean, you all have been very uh, gracious in approving equipment for us to do so, and we've been utilizing that as much as possible. And I think we've been saving a lot of dollars um, as part of our budget for that. So um, really, I'm just going to kind of go over it quickly again, because we uh, we've got more stuff on the agenda. And actually, I've got um, Aaron Povic here with Sweetwater, who is our consultant that we work with for our MS4, which is our, our uh, stormwater permit with the DNR. So that's our next item. So um, it's kind of a lead into to that. So if there's any questions, otherwise I will move on from the snow and ice report. I believe we had a question from somebody a couple months ago about if we're saving money this year because we didn't have to go out as often and, and salt as often. 
And I, I re remember reaching out to you and I replied back to that constituent that, well, we bought all the salt in advance. So Correct. no there, but we are, we did save a, quite a bit of money on overtime that we didn't have as many snow events this year. That, that's and exactly. We'll buy less salt next year. Correct. Yes, yeah. exactly. I know we had to, we, what we do is we have a contract to a certain amount and we, I think it was uh 1200 tons, I think this year. And Unfortunately, we had to kind of find room because we're committed to buying that amount. So we we're we're stuffed at the gills basically in our in our yard right now. So um, that is the intent. Yes, each year is to use less and less. And obviously, the salt does impact our waters, which go all of our storm sewer, which does go into the river, which goes into the lake. So great segue into our next point here. But that's really unless there's any other questions about the snow and ice review. Uh, I th I think I kind of just quickly touched upon everything. Are there any questions from any members of the council about the snow and ice? Alderman Shelton, go ahead. No, nothing really specific, but I know in the past we talked about potentially having some kind of mailbox maintenance program or something that would prevent us from having to pay for knockdowns if they're knocked down. It looks like we don't have that many. There was only um, three this year. So um, if anything, that might just be good for property maintenance, but not really for this reason. So. And I think too, with that was we we were very good about putting it in the newsletter to make sure that all the residents make sure that their their uh, their mailbox posts and everything are because quite frankly, that's what it is. It's never our plows hitting the uh, mailboxes per se. It's just the snow coming off of them. And with the heavy wet snow, it does knock down a couple, but that's usually because of a uh, a post that's deteriorated over the years and the resident hasn't maintained it. So we try to be, forthcoming up front and let everybody know, Hey, make sure your mailboxes are in good shape before the winter season. So yeah, we've, we've been, uh, we've been having less and we actually had a couple of new operators this year too. So it was kind of a good introduction, but I think more of the season guys know better what to do to avoid them. All right. Alderman Galhart, go ahead. The money that we saved on overtime uh, for this last season, because it was pretty light. Does that just roll over then uh, to your department for the next year or what, what happens there? It doesn't per se pull over. It just means we have a better operating balance in a particular fiscal year than we would have projected to. So hopefully all that cost savings adds up to a better fund balance at the end. And then that fund balance is carried over and then everything starts from scratch the next year. And if we continually have lower overtime because of less snow, then we budget for that, but we don't want to do that until we know we have a long-term trend because we don't want to exceed the budget. Right. So it, it just, it, it's not department specific, then it, it's just the kind of the general fund then. Well, it, it is line item specific. So there's a line item in the general fund in public works for overtime. What overtime that is, is not specific. They do have it in the payroll program. So we do know how many hours are snow and ice control, water main breaks, um, and all the other emergency call outs, but in the budget, it's simply overtime and public works. Majority of that's going to be snow plowing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. All right. Any other questions? All right. We're going to move on then to the next item. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a communication from the Department of Public Works relating to the general permit to discharge under the Wisconsin Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. And I will turn it over once again to Mr. Immig and Sorry, what was your name again? Erin Povac. Erin, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'll try to keep it brief, but I know that the DNR is pretty excited that we're here talking to you about this exciting topic tonight. Um, I work with Sweetwater. We consult with the city of Glendale on their permit um, compliance activities. We're going to talk a little bit about stormwater, the regulations, a few pollutants that we have to manage for, and then if there's anything else you want to say about salt strategy. Um, so what is stormwater pollution? A lot of people think they know what it is, but then it's hard to actually articulate it. It's any precipitation, so rain, snow that falls on impervious surfaces. Um, and the reason it's a problem is because it picks up all the pollutants that accumulate there over time and washes it into your stormwater conveyance system that goes into our Milwaukee River, Lake Michigan, and it's completely untreated. So oils, PCBs, heavy metals, uh, fertilizers, you name it, it's going into the public waters that we share. So as such, we have the stormwater permit that helps us be in compliance essentially with the Clean Water Act. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details. It regulates a lot and it makes your Department of Work, Public Works have to do a lot of work on top of what they're already doing on a daily basis. Um, the DNR calls out specific pollutants like total suspended solids, phosphorus, uh, fecal coliform, so bacteria, and it 
sets limits on how much the city of Glendale is actually allowed to put into the public waters. Um, those limits work. You guys came up with those numbers by doing some pretty ex you know, excessive modeling. You used engineering firms and consultants to actually come up with your waste load allocation numbers. And every time we get a new permit, you've got to shrink those numbers down more and more and more. And the way you do that is through different projects. It could be capital projects, green infrastructure, um, behavior change and education. That's what that permit's all about. So one thing that we try to do, uh, Glendale's permit expires in 2026, and this is a shared permit with the rest of the North Shore groups. Um, we try to anticipate what pollutants are coming down the pipeline. So what are we going to have to pay attention to just so we're not blindsided by it? And there's um, a plan in place and there's money in the budget to deal with it. And an emerging pollutant in this region is chlorides, and that comes from our winter roads management. Salt use has increased. This graph is from 1940 to about 2010. Um, granted, we have more roads, but the expectations are just higher. We don't want any ice, any snow on the roads. We want it clean right away. So we're throwing a lot of salt down historically. Um, right here, we see the Milwaukee River, Menominee River, the KK. Uh, we're measuring chloride concentrations. They're also increasing and there's a seasonal component. So we know it's coming from salt use. Chloride is toxic to aquatic life. If you put one teaspoon of salt into a five gallon bucket of water, that water is toxic. It's a permanent pollutant. Um, once it's in the water system, it's not going away. It's gonna be in your groundwater, uh, lakes, rivers, it's staying. There are also economic impacts for every $1 that the city spends on salt. The estimate is that you get $10 worth of damage. So that's damage to vegetation, um, vehicles, infrastructure. Also, there's another pollutant that we're trying to limit. That's our total suspended solids. And if we use more salt, you actually get more total suspended solids because it changes the water holding capacity of soil. You get a lot of erosion. So it makes a job we're already trying to do even harder. Did you want to say anything else about salt strategy? Yeah, numbers? I can quick touch upon this. I kind of did talk about it a little bit previously. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, we're responsible for 142 lane miles. And part of that is, again, reducing the salt and the amount. And as you know, from the approval of the snow and ice policy is we do not have a bare road policy in Glendale, but we do a pretty good job of keeping it passable. And again, that's with less salt. So I'm kind of going off topic here on these, but we do have policies in place for chlor chloride reduction. Um, so we are responsible for those to reduce the salt on our on our roads. Charlie, what's in the brine? Brine is just salted water. It is salted yep. water. Okay. Correct. Yep. Yep. Sometimes if it's cold enough, we do put in calcium chloride because at a certain temperature it will still refreeze or whatever. So I think it's below 15 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. We do add some additives to it to keep it from, from freezing. And unfortunately, a lot of the communities that aren't uh, adjacent to rivers like us can use organic compounds like beet juice. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or not, but unfortunately we can't because of our permit. So it's kind of a, a catch 22, but we are, what we do have, we do try to reduce that amount of, of impact. Um, let's see, kind of the year end review. I did talk about that previously, kind of the amounts that we did. So we actually use a little bit less brine only because we had less events this year. Um, we do actually are using more per those events than we did. So it's kind of, it goes up and down accordingly. And then of course the, uh, the salt that we use was less each year. So, um, again, we're trying to keep tar targeting that. Um, again, so we're bringing this to you as support. And again, this is an educational requirement as part of our permit. So, um, we're kind of checking two boxes as well. And then, um, kind of some steps moving forward in November. Um, we'll start uh, sending out materials, things like that, with follow up again to evaluate that, and then, um, uh, and then we'll submit that to the DNR for, for our uh, our measurements. Well, well, part of those recommendations include advice to our residents about the amount they throw on their sidewalks. And we've been doing that through uh, throughout the year. We do have, and especially during the snow and ice season, we send it out in our newsletters. It's in, uh, in our uh, news flashes and things like that about ways to conserve. If you salt and it's still left after an event, sweep it back up. You can reuse it, you know, so that it doesn't melt and go into our water. So we have been sharing those. Uh, those strategies throughout the year and summer, we have uh, tips on washing cars and things like that and, and uh, grass clipping. So again, those don't make it into the storm sewer 
um, and try to prevent it as well. So we are pretty proactive in doing that. I have, a, I have a, someone in my neighborhood that when I walk my dog, we literally go out in the street to go around their property because they throw so much salt. It's like walking on gravel. And, and unfortunately, that's our biggest offender right. are the private lots. So the private contract is your liability. And maybe Aaron can speak to this too. I know there is a movement to try and change this you know, at a, at a higher level within the state to reduce liability. Because it, quite frankly, I mean, when you're crunching on a road and I've got a dog too, it's one of those things where, I mean, he's, he'll wear the, the paw protectors, but most dogs won't. So I'm very aware of what, uh, what you're talking about. Let me go hard. Uh, it seems that uh, given the, the city's policy of not plowing, unless there's at least three inches of snow, it, it, historically, it seems that in, instead of plowing in those situations, you lay salt down. Isn't that right? That was the old policy, but the new one you approved is we are actually plowing more. So it's the, the three inch rule is no longer really in effect. I mean, we we are plowing more to avoid exactly what you're saying, where we have those situations where it becomes hard packed and you have to salt it off. And, and that's that's kind of an old school way of thinking. So we've changed that through the through our new policy and the way we operate is to get out there quicker, get it, keep it getting off. And that allows a brine to work better as well. And uh, just, a, I guess, a, a question or comment for Aaron. Um, so in, in my district, we don't have storm sewers. We, we have these swales. Uh, and so I'm thinking that there isn't salt going directly like into the lake right away. Is that factored into the permit and all for uh, Glendale? Because it's, you know, I mean, maybe eventually it goes through the groundwater and, you know, years later it gets to the lake. But I mean, for the most part, I mean, you know, we don't have storm sewers with salt water going directly to the lake. That should factor into, you know, our permit. It does. And I'll just speak to grab back from Aaron here, but uh, we, in our community, we have both. And we have a higher concentration of curb and gutter where we do have water that goes directly to the river versus like a Fox Point where it's primarily ditches. I mean, they don't have much of, of anything in that regard. So yes, it is factored into our permit, um, but we still have that uh, initiative to, to reduce it. But it is helpful, yes, having ditches. But there is the vegetation aspect as well. Salt is damaging any way you cut it. Um, one thing that I would like to ask all of you is part of our education effort. We work on a campaign in conjunction with the city, but we're always looking for new channels with which to disseminate information. Um, and so as council members, we're thinking you might have ways to reach constituents that um, we don't. So the ask is in the fall when we start ramping up our SALT campaign, can we come to you with materials that have been pre-made and have you share them with people any way you can? I think most of our elders have uh, an email distribution list. Plus, we utilize Nextdoor and Facebook and other social media, and we have a city newsletter. Yeah, we tap into some of. Um, and then, if we do come to you for some additional help, we might have to administer a follow-up survey to see what you've learned and what your experience was. And this isn't to take up your time; it's because uh, we check a box on our DNR permitting by educating council members as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Any any questions or comments from members of the council? All right, well, thank you. Appreciate thank you. your presentation. Uh, okay, the next item is actually one I asked to have on the agenda, and that is uh, I'm asking the council to um, allocate up to $1,000 if needed for the kickoff of our 75th anniversary celebration. Uh, June 28th of this year actually marks 75 years uh, to the day when the vote was held for the town of Milwaukee to uh, incorporate as a city of the fourth class. So we're planning an event. I've been working with the Glendale Women's Club. So we're going to be meeting at the town hall over here. There'll be a short little 10 or 15 minute presentation about uh, the vote that particular day. Um, interestingly enough, um, the whole concept of election denial apparently existed for a long time because as soon as that vote happened and was recorded, somebody who didn't like the outcome went to court and spent the next 18 months fighting the town of Milwaukee from incorporating as a city, trying to, to indicate that uh, the vote was fraudulent. I actually got a copy of all the records and I passed them on to the folks writing our history book, indicating the vote was fraudulent, that there were people that were allowed to vote that shouldn't have been allowed to vote. It was all the same stuff we still hear in about elections now. So, um, But they lost in court and that's why December of 1950 is when we were incorporated as a city. It took about 18 months for that. 
So I'm asking uh, the council to allocate up to $1,000 uh, should the women's club need it as they're helping me plan that event. So can I get a motion to that effect, please? I'll move. Move Alderman Doherty. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman Gelhart. Any questions, comments? But what do we think the funds might go for? Do we know? Um, if they want to serve, like, I don't know, popsicles and water bottles, you know, I, I, we don't know. So okay. if we end up doing a banner of some sort, so just Got, having yeah. the money there that they know they can spend if they it, need it. It's a public event. Everybody can come and celebrate. So, right, so right. it's for those sort of purposes for the public. Okay. Yep. Yep. I didn't think, yes, Alderman Gelhart. Just a. Uh, Excited that we're finally going to have an event in the uh, Milwaukee Town Hall. We've been talking about that for a few years now, so I'm looking forward to it. Oh, just so you know, in next year, in, in 2025, we're going to have at least one of our common council meetings in the old town hall. It won't be broadcast over Zoom that because there's <laughs> no, no technology in that old building, but we're definitely going to do a common council meeting in there. So any other comments or questions? Okay, all those in favor of allocating the funds for the 75th anniversary kickoff, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? Motion carries. I would just add, I actually did got to be a research assistant for the group working on the book, and I went to the archives. I got those court documents from that case, and actually, we tried to incorporate in 1926, and there was a lawsuit that stopped the election from happening. Because they tried to take essentially, there would be no Bayside if we had incorporated in 1926, because the line, it went all the way to the county line. The entire town of Milwaukee would have incorporated as a city of the fourth class. Fox Point had just incorporated as a village. So it would have been a little portion of, of River Hills that hadn't been annexed, or was now River Hills that hadn't been annexed from the town yet. And uh, all of Bayside and Glendale. So uh, they have a name for it. They didn't have a name yet. The name was actually chosen by uh, a police chief in like the late 40s. His name was Oscar Teets. He's the one that uh, chose the name of Glendale. So anyway, so we'll have a lot of fun with that. I, I've enjoyed learning the history of, of the community. All right. Um, now on to page two of a very, very long agenda. Uh, the next item is the appointment of Jeremy Triblett to the police commission. Uh, Jeremy is joining us. He's in the back. Um, Jeremy is, and is uh, the, e, so if I can remember this, the emergency prevention manager. Thank you. Prevention integration manager from Milwaukee County. One of the things he's done recently is, I don't know if you know, but then the, the, the combating the opioid epidemic, there are Narcan vending machines that have been placed in health departments, fire stations, police stations around the county. It's one of the things that he's overseen uh, recently is getting those out there so that people can come in and, and get Narcan to administer to somebody who's in the middle of an overdose. So, um, uh, but uh, he and I had about an hour and a half uh, uh, meeting uh, about a week and a half ago, and I'm asking to have him appointed to a vacancy on the police commission. Um, and so I would like to ask for a motion to appoint Jeremy Triblett to the police commission, please. Thank you. Moved by Alderman Vukovic. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman Doherty. Any questions? Any discussion? Alderman Vukovic, go ahead. Triplett, you are taking my seat. <laughs> Do it well and give them hell. Thank you. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> like acceptance. <laughs> Ferguson's like I'm out of here. <laughs> no, I, I, I am. I did not. I just saw um, him being appointed when I was reading. I am very familiar with his work. He has done trainings at my organization as well as other organizations. He has worked with the Glendale District when I was um, president. So he is familiar with Glendale, and I trust him very much to. Um, help lead um, the c police commission. So I am 100%, um, if it wasn't me, but since it's not, 100% <laughs> um, um, okay with, uh, and just loving the fact that it, he is part of the police commission. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. All those in favor of approving Jeremy Triplett's appointment to the police commission, please say aye. 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 Those no? Motion carries. And Jeremy, I know there's a meeting on Wednesday and you have to be sworn in sometime before that meeting. Uh, Jessica over here is the deputy city administrator. She's the one that can help you with the oath of office. So if you've got a card or if you've got a way of connecting with Jessica or if you guys already connected. I actually have the to stay after the meeting. We can do it right away tonight or we can do it tomorrow. To do it tonight. If you guys want to walk in the hall and do it, if he's got to leave, I would recommend doing that. So you we have can to get him appointed. Okay. We can go do that. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. 
Yeah. All right. Uh, next item, I believe, was put on the agenda by Alderman Vukovic, and that is for our annual participation in the Milwaukee's Juneteenth Parade. Now we'll turn it over to Alderman. We're free. We are free. We are free. This is what Juneteenth is all about. Um, City of Glendale is so. I am ninety nine point nine percent sure City of Glendale is the was as of now the only city to come in and do Juneteenth with City of Milwaukee. Um, in a four years or three years now. Uh, you've year. been doing it since I was elected to the school board. So um, a, a City of Glendale has been oh. represented either by school board with me, and I think the year after. So it's been seven years at least. Okay. Um, I, I think almost all of you guys have participated in one time or another. Uh, Steve has, I, I think you have, Jim, you have, I, I believe this too, but at one point or another, everybody has, has tried to, well, there is a, um, a cost to this just by buying the candy. Um, uh, they have waived the fee the last couple of years, might not be able to get it weighed up. I'll work on it. Um, but just in case, it. yeah, I'll work on it. But for just candy. in case, um, it's more up for the candy that we we give out. And then the I think it's a hundred dollar fee to to be in the parade now. There was discussion at the ICC about this because we do it. Um, and I know that I, I believe that Shorewood is going to be entering this year. Brown Deer has its own uh, unit they're entering, while Watosa is entering. So I mean, so we're you the mean trailblazers. We started. Copying, yeah, but that's okay because that <laughs> yeah. means that there is um, a true sense of camaraderie within Milwaukee and the suburbs, at the suburbs. So I, um, I'm glad I, you know, we were one of the few people who did it. Now I'm glad that people are following the lead. All right. So the request is that we um, allocate um, the five hundred five hundred dollars for parade fees and parade candy. Can I get a motion then to um, to approve the allocation of the money? Okay. Okay, move by Alderman Vukovic. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman Bailey. Any discussion? Alderman Doherty. I'm looking, Look, I'm looking at this. I looked into whether we have any money that goes for candy for 4th of July. And I'm kind of disappointed to say we don't, as far as I can tell. So I guess I'd like to see us at this point add that, some money the 4th of July for candy. That that has been a conversation that's already been had. It'll be on our next agenda in June. Okay. No, that that's it's on there. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be on the next agenda in June. Yeah, well, we don't I need, bought we don't my own candy, but last time I didn't buy enough. Yeah. <laughs> I need to buy more and you almost can't carry enough. So yeah. Oh, there's ways you need to talk to an expert. <laughs> yeah, I was at, I uh, literally uh, buy. I thought about it at Costco over this last week, and I'm like, it's about that time. Yeah. So, but yes, there's, there's got to be ways to get it in bulk. So, I've used campaign funds to purchase what I give out in the parade for what the whole time I've been mayor. I don't raise any money. I don't mind putting money in it, but yeah. I really want us to be more yeah. on purpose because if you ever got to hand out candy to parade, you really there's not many things that are cooler. So right. we need there's, more of that. There's other, there's a resident, two residents that always give me candy to do in the, the 4th of July. Um, they anonymously give me the candy to put out for kids. So that's one of the things that residents could possibly do if they want to give it to us to, to do that. It's been work. Um, I have two residents that do it every year. Yeah. They're in your districts, but you know, they <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> Well, I, 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 and, uh, so we don't meet at the, our last meeting of the month is canceled because it's Memorial Day. So the next meeting we have will be in June. What is it, June 9th? Um, is it 9th or 10th? I thought it was the 10th. 10th, June 10th. Um, next meeting is June 10th. So that it'll be on the agenda for June 10th to allocate the money. And then it'll just become one of the, I think from this point forward, it'll just become one of the, one of the functions of the city is to provide, you know, a boatload of candy for us to take out for the kids on the on like the, the technical floor. use of that term. Yeah, and it and I almost said something else when I correct myself and use boatloads. So. But hey, what what's I've the amount found, allocated towards boatload? I, I need to definitely. Well, that. one thing that um is is that we found when it's Valentine's Day, day after Valentine's Day, very after Easter, there are sales for candy and that's when we go by and then put it away so the city could save money if it's allocated already or we know about it ahead of time 
they can go and grab that 20, 50%, the 75% off of candy. And I'm also thinking if we do this for Juneteenth and there's leftovers, well, we can share there's the love. Never like, that there's never leftovers at Juneteenth. Well, it depends how much we get. I, yeah. But I do know it for the Definitely 4th of July, candy. you always have to thin it out at the end. Those poor yeah. people closer to the park, they didn't walk as far, so they just don't get as much candy. All right, I think I'm done thinking. All right, so it's been moved and seconded. We've had our discussion. Um, all those in favor of allocating the $500 for parade fees and the parade candy for Juneteenth, please say aye. 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 Those no? Motion carries. Uh, next item, item H, uh, the owner of the property actually reached out earlier today and asked to have this withdrawn from the agenda. Apparently the, the language is still not where he wants it to be in the work he's doing with the potential buyer of the property. So we said we'd, we'd pull it. Uh, next item is review and action on a certified survey map for Bayshore Shopping Center property owner LLC, 5800 Bayshore Drive. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kennedy. The Plan Commission previously had a meeting to recommend the approval of the CSM for this parcel of property on the southeast corner of the Bayshore property near, near Silver Spring. Um, it's essentially the Crumble Cookie and Citizens First Bank building. Uh, they are desiring to create a separate CDM and property for CSM, sorry, for this property in order to um, sell it off at a later point. Is that 5,800 or is that 5,600? Because it's right on Silver Spring, which is 5,600. Uh, we have the address here at 5,800. Okay. Maybe that's what they're breaking it off from. Because this address would be right, what, 50, it's on the east side. It would be 5,600, 5,602, something like that. Because it's right on the on the corner of Silver Spring, which is 5,600 north. It doesn't have the address on this okay. personal map here, but it is. The, but it's the bank and Crumble Cookies property. That is correct. Yes. So Bayshore, we're going to be seeing more of these. Bayshore is in the process right now of creating, uh, asking for us to create separate certified survey maps because they're selling off properties as investments. So, all right. Uh, can we get a motion then to approve the certified survey map? So moved. Second. By Gelhard, seconded by Schmelzling. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Oh no. Aries. Uh, next one is a certified survey map for Phoenix Glendale Industries investors at 5055 North Lydell. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kennedy. Again, the Plan Commission recommended approval of the attached uh, CSM for the division of properties here located at 5050 Lydell. This is per the redevelopment agreement for this property that there would be two different um, parcels um, with two different parcel numbers. Um, as soon as both of these are approved, we will take them over to the Register of Deeds for recording. Any questions or comments? Alderman Schmelzling? I know this is part of that master plan that was being put together for that division of the property. I was leaving it at that. Development agreement. Development yeah. agreement, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm assuming that they will still have some way to get to the, the parcel that they no longer can get to from um, Port Washington Road as part of this because it looks like they'll just be the newer development and then the older building that'll be still in existence, but cut in half. It's, it has no like access to the parking lot any longer. So I'm guessing they'll, they'll work that all out between the two properties at some point. And the two properties are still owned by the same I, company. Um, and Ian from Phoenix is online, so he can answer those questions, but there is obviously access off of Port Washington road. And then I think on the Southern portion of the property, there's access um, to the southern parcel, which will probably remain 5050 Lydell. The northern property will most likely have a Port Washington address. That entrance will, and is dictated in development agreement, will primarily be off of Port Washington Road. Right. The southern property, they still have that entrance for the um, the employees on the southern part of the property. And Ian, correct me if I'm wrong, that that's the continued plan. But I think the question here is, if people are pulling in off of Port Washington Road to access the southernmost property, they're gonna. There's going to have to be some sort of an easement agreement right. to go yep. drive across the parking lot of the northernmost property to get to the southernmost property because there isn't any direct access. That's yeah, or, it's, or, it's the or, same or, owner of both properties, right. so I don't know that they need an, an easement, and I don't know what their direction on that is. But certainly, they could do that if they ever decide to. Um, right, if they ever were to sell it off to potentially the, the property that would be newly developed or something along those lines. I would think they're dividing it for some reason. So right. yeah, and there is an easement right now to get access to this property from Port Washington Road because that part is not owned by Phoenix investors. So that easement does exist. But yeah, whether or not there's a future easement for that, that Ian could answer that. He's on he just on meter himself. Actually, Ian, we are going to ask you if you could weigh in here because I guess the question is um 
you know, usually when there's a certified survey map division of a property like this, it's because one of those properties is likely going to be sold and not held by the same owner. So uh, can you just tell us, is that uh, other property one that you're planning to sell? And will you be including some sort of an easement and access to parking on the other property um, for whatever happens with the Southern property? Yep. Uh, you guys are spot on. Um, no plans to sell either parcel or property. Um, and internally, we are working on a access easement from the northern parcel to the southern parcel, say, um, if any of the tenants have any truck activity, obviously that stuff needs to come off of Northport, Washington, uh, so that we are working on an easement um, currently. Um, so you, that's, you know, that's something that's being considered, you know, at this time. Thank you. Yeah, that was just my concern of long term, they would lose their ability to, you know, get to the building as they had prior. Yep. Are any other questions? Okay, can I get a motion then to approve the CSM for 5055 North Lydell? Moved by Gelhard. Is there a second? Second by Bailey. Any further discussion? All in favor of approving the CSM, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next item is a recommendation of the Legislative Judiciary and Finance Committee, which met right before the council meeting tonight. It's an application for a Class B beer retailer license and Class C wine retailer license filed by Primetime Events LLC for the TAP at the Yard, located at 5689 North Bayshore Drive. Alderman Doherty, you chaired the committee. What's your report for the committee? Uh, the committee approved uh, granting those retail licenses. Okay. Um, and I know there was a, a, a comment earlier today, a couple of questions asked by a resident in the community. Um, I guess two things here. One was whether or not our language in our ordinance indicates that we could give uh, a Class C license to this particular property. And the language in our ordinance says that it may be granted. Um, it doesn't say will. It says may be granted to a restaurant. It doesn't say that it can't be granted to other people. And so with the, the way in which our ordinance is written, it does uh, leave open the flexibility without having to change our ordinance that we are in compliance with the new state statutes that allow for this uh, kind of a license to be given um, outside of being a restaurant. Um, so um, so that was one question. The other question, it was uh, there was a, a minor, uh, what our city attorney referred to as a scrivener's error. Um, when this, uh, the owner or the company is Primetime Events LLC, the business will be the tap at the yard. And then um, this was sent off to the Journal Sentinel. Uh, we comply with the public notice uh, requirement for a, a beer and wine retailer licenses. And there was a typo made at the time it was uh, sent off to the Journal Sentinel or the North Shore Now that it accidentally listed it as Primetime Tap instead of Primetime Events LLC. Um, but all the other information, including the agent, the address, the type of license, and the name of the business that will be operating under, were all correct. And so uh, the opinion of the city attorney is that this is a scrivener's error and so could move forward. And both of those were already explained to the committee beforehand. So um, that was the committee's recommendation. Would you like to move that on behalf of the committee? I would. I would um, move that we accept uh, and grant those the Class B and the Class C retail licenses for primetime events. LLC. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second by moved by Doherty, seconded by Gelhard. Alderman Vukovic, go ahead. Uh, I do. Have... You speak into the microphone. Yeah. I was on the committee. Um, who is the owner or who is the name that is? Uh, that would be on the application. And I, it's like, that's the thing. The application what was, was published attached. was an N marking is what was in the General Sentinel publication. So it was what? Um, it was a first initial N and last name marking because I did find the public notice earlier and I sent that to the uh, city administrator and the city attorney um, who's the indicating owner? The, dis the slight discrepancy. That's the the owner is the same person as the agent. It is. Okay. Yeah, it's just a first, what was published in the Journal Sentinel notice was a first initial N, last name marking, M-A-R-K-I-N-G. Okay. I... Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of granting the Class B and Class C licenses to primetime events, please say aye. 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 Those no. Motion carries. 
Uh, next item is approval and agreement with RISE Leadership for Professional Leadership Coaching Services for a 12-month period, not to exceed 62000 and actually it's divided up part of it this year, part of that next year. And I will turn it over to Mr. Warwick. Um, and the person that uh, is representing RISE Leadership is also joining us on the call. So thank you, Mayor Kennedy. I'll take up a portion of this because this was a, a big team effort to um, decide what um, to do um, for sort of leadership training here at the city for some of our leaders. Um, you know, we discussed it here as being an important element to make sure that we are always getting the most out of our employees and that we're doing the best for them to keep everybody mentally and physically focused. Um, the mayor and I interviewed several firms that specialize in leadership. Um, we are recommending um, an agreement with Rise Leadership and Ben, who is on the Zoom call today. Um, the agreement calls for a 12-month um, leadership program, six months for this year, and then six months into the 2025 budget. Um, the services are sort of described in there, um, you know, 30, 60 to 90 minutes um, under this program, you know, a couple times a month uh, for leadership training um, with Ben. So, um, you know, we feel he provides a great program here, could be a great service to everybody here who works for the city. Just tell us, I believe we have five individuals in the city that will be working with him. Could you just tell us who those are? Yeah, it'd be myself, the deputy city administrator, director of public works, chief of police, city clerk, and then also the finance manager, Jolyn. So six, five okay. and myself. Okay. All right. Um, any questions for, I uh, got it all to Mr. Rosling. Sorry, this is the one I feel a little awkward asking about, but so it's six people, one and a half hours, twice a month for a year, right? So and what are the other services that are provided other than just the, the in-person coaching and training? Yeah, I'll turn and, this over to Ben. He can probably describe this better than hi, I ben. can. Since he Thank you. Does this. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> I'm at a, my daughter's track meet, so I'm in my car. So thanks for uh, accommodating me here. And yeah, excited to work with you. So Really big picture. Our our firm is is uh, what I would call an all in leadership development firm. So yes, there are there's a process. We work with the city of Appleton. We work with the city of Green Bay. We work with the government finance officers association out of Chicago. So we work with cities and counties all across the country. And our primary goal is to help all the leaders apply and implement leadership best practices, both from a team development and a leadership development standpoint. So. Yes, there are there are scheduled, you know, 60 to 90 minute sessions once and twice a month. However, there's also assessments and processes that we use throughout the year to help the leaders and the team really implement these. So if, if there's a situation coming up where we are absolutely available to the team for above and beyond phone calls, conversations, challenges with their team, successes they're having. And so... <clears throat> We really aren't interested in just sort of going through the motions. We're interested in people having uh, the the teams and the leadership teams that they deserve. So, yes, the, if you sort of break it down by hour, you'd say, wow, that's a, a significant investment. And it is. But to me, we're all in. And I take a limited number of clients to make sure that if Mayor Brian or if anyone calls me on the team, we have conversations that we can have to help support the group, inc including you all. So if there's things that you would want to communicate with me, however, the coaching work that we do with these six individuals is completely confidential. So it is really designed to help support them and help them feel stable and secure and, and safe and effective. So uh, it's confidential with all of them. However, talking with Carl about how to move the team and the organization forward, uh, that's work that we do uh, all the time. So it's sort of an all in uh, we're invested in the in the groups getting better, and uh, we've got a, we've coached um, you know hundreds and thousands. Myself and Mark Derwalker, who's a retired superintendent of schools from Kakana Area Schools, who led an amazing turnaround at his school district. You know, he led hundreds of people there. So he and I partnered together in really developing this team and making sure that uh, you know we really help support the team as best we can. All right. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. I know uh, I yeah. see you in the car. You're all in there, sneaking away, <laughs> not going when we'll get to the agenda topic. Um, yeah, yeah just, no worries. Yeah, it was just a, when I, you know, I'm a very detail oriented to the math, but knowing that it's it's not just that there's other things that are part of the service. I Correct. Makes me. Yeah. And we've worked with Harvard. We we created some proprietary leadership development assessments. So all the assessments are included. All of our time is included. We have books and resources and trainings. We have online trainings that are available so that all of all the services that we offer are all included uh, for the city of Glendale for this this uh, this partnership. Thank you. Well, we'll do our best to take full advantage of it then. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? 
I would just say that um, Milwaukee County implemented a coaching starting under the previous county executive, and it's continued now for about five and a half years. Milwaukee County, the county executive, and the entire, all the department heads in Milwaukee County. And if you look at the way county government runs now, as opposed to county government, say, a decade ago, there is an entire sea change in the way that the departments are run, the leadership development that's been done. And it's been because the heads of all the departments have coaching. Um, regular coaching, and it has been uh, phenomenal to see the way the, the leadership development has been done at Milwaukee County. So, all right. Um, so can I get a motion then to approve the agreement? So moved. Move by Alderman Bailey. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman Doherty. Any further discussion? And I believe this is broken up because there's only seven months left in the year. It's 36,000 this year, 26,000 next year. Is that right? Yeah, so just roughly that... put it at 31 and 31, just breaking it up halfway because we're almost towards June right now, which is the halfway point. By the time okay. we pay a bill, it will be June, and then the next one will be paid in the next year. For So it's a, about six months of payments. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? Just yeah, go ahead, Alderman Schmelzing. Make sure the contract doesn't say January 2024. I noted that, but anyways, just a typo again. Asked that already? <laughs> that was right. thank you correct that yeah, well I, i'll uh make sure that we look at that before it gets signed so all right all those in favor of approving say aye aye, aye. opposed motion carries all right ben thanks for joining us let you get back to the track meet thank you everybody yes looking forward to meeting you all in person take care take care bye all right next then is review and possible action and approval out of amendment with safe built Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. Okay. Um, so this is one of the, probably one of the first contracts that we've executed under the new purchasing policy, which allows the city administrator to execute certain contracts under ed emergency provisions. Um, so the city's planner left employment with the city unexpectedly, um, left a big gap to fill, which was the review of zoning permit applications like sheds, decks, fences, setbacks, heights for buildings. Um, we've had a lot of fences and decks and sheds come in that have been reviewed by staff while we've transitioned um, to safe, safe built. Um, and, and obviously, safe built is our contractor for building plan review and inspections. Under this contract would be amendment number two. Amendment one was for the, um, the building um, permit software that we discussed several months ago. Uh, this amendment number two would provide them the ability to do plan review and issuance of permits related to zoning. So they would ensure that the zoning code was intact before the permits were issued. Prior to that, the city's planner would review all of those as part of his other job. This, since Safe Built is already reviewing these plans, it is our plan, depending on how this agreement goes, that we would continue to work with them to perform this issuance of permits um, for these these um, tracks. We would put it in the in the workflow to accomplish this. Um, the rate hourly rate for them to work on this is one hundred and ten dollars per hour. Um, we needed to do amendment here because the current contract provides a percentage split based on the amount of the permit fee. Here, there aren't always specific permit fees for these things, so the hourly rate was was issued and taken um, for this agreement. There might be a better way to do it as we work out the process for how it's done, but in the in the interim, to try to get these permits out and issued with the spring and everybody wanting to get work done, um, we felt this was the most expeditious way to do it. All right, we'll open up to any questions or comments. Alderman Doherty, go ahead. Probably could have read it and missed it, but how long are we committing for so we get a time, you know, to see how it's working and then we can reevaluate it, right? So the, the general agreement with Safe Built, um, I don't know, that's a very good question, what the termination provisions are, but simply for something like this, we just won't send it to them if we don't want them to do it. So it's really elective on our part not to send them. So if, if we have a, a, a disagreement on a fence, a deck, or we don't like the service they're providing, or we feel it's too expensive, we just choose not to send it to them. We're not obligated under this agreement to do it. But if we do send it to them, we pay this hourly rate for the work to get. Done. Yeah, I think this could be a, a great benefit and actually a cost benefit to the city. Yeah. But I just want to make sure we're not stuck, if you will. Yeah, I mean, with, with the provisions of the original agreement are still in place. And mm -hmm. I didn't check on when, when that um, agreement expires, but that's a good point. But in this one, we just simply won't send it to them and then we will find other resources to do it. In this Very case. good, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Alderman Gellhart, go ahead. I, I guess uh, in, kind of in a similar vein, I, I looked at this uh, agenda item and the next one uh, kind of together. 
Uh, and I, so, so we don't have a community development position uh, anymore, or we don't have that person there anymore. We don't have the city planner. And I looked at these two items as being kind of the, the substitution uh, for those services. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, that is a very fair statement. Um, the other part to that, and that's a good point, I'll cover both of these together because they're they're both kind of related, is the next agreement for Vandewall was also executed because we don't have a community development director. He left employment of the city as well. So the agreement with Vandewall partially covers those services of taking development agreements and site improvements, like some of the recent developments we've seen, and taking them from start to finish. Those are billable hours to a developer that the city will bill back so we won't have those costs anymore and we can use them when we want. The other part of, of uh, the Vandewald agreement, and we see this as a temporary thing, is answering questions on zoning, on fences, on decks. You know, people call in more than they submit permits for, where can I put my fence? Where can I put my deck? Is um, we've hired Vandewald to do that until we refill that planner position, which we have posted right now. So we plan on refilling the planner position, we've named it a little differently and tweaked the job a little bit because they won't be issuing permits. But that part of the position we filled, the community development director position will be filled with this contract by Van de Waal to handle um, the review and submittal of documents required to take things from initial contact at the Common Council to the Plan Commission to um, development approval through the CSMs like tonight with Phoenix. And I, I think that it, it just kind of echoing uh, Alder Mendarni's uh, comment, but perhaps maybe at the year end, you take a look at what, what the cost was for uh, these services versus what we would have paid individuals in these uh, positions and say, okay, is it worthwhile continuing this or should we perhaps, you know, fill the, the community development position after all? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a very good point. And I've thought about that too, with the issuance of permits. The, the hard thing is to know exactly how much time the planner spent on the issue of permits to know what that exact cost is because it was built in as a part of his job. We typically approve the city budget at the end of October, beginning of November. Mm -hmm. So we'd be about six months in at that point. We'd have a really good opportunity. We could always, well, the budget will be presented to us probably in like September or beginning of October. Um, by the time we get to the point of approving it, we could make amendments at the very end if we felt like we wanted to direct staff to hire the position as opposed to maintaining the contract. Yeah, and well, as well as our evaluation on the time flow of this, because this is a little change, is taking an employee out and putting a contractor in, which requires management as well to, to see how mm -hmm. the administrative workflow goes to is an important part of it. And you said you restructured the planner position, correct? That is correct. It would be called the assistant to the administrator, which is part of that whole promotional process that we discussed with management analyst, assistant to deputy administrator and city administrator. Gives that whole promotional flow to try to create more development opportunities within the organization. So oh, any other questions or comments? Because then I'm going to move forward with motions. All right. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Alderman. I just think this, was, this was very quick thinking on your feet to come up with a solution. So I, I just want to applaud the city staff for that and also everyone helping out. I know I've had one um, constituent come to me about a, a shed and just uh, it's those are the things you don't think about that just happen day in and day out. So thank you for keeping the lights on through this as always. And uh, on top of matters, I do think the the planner position is something that we should have some specialty in house because it really is central to our community. But at the same time, a shed permit's a shed permit, so it makes sense to um, supplement where we can. Thank you. And it, this was really a team effort. Jessica over on the other end has picked up a lot of the slack too, particularly with the the issuance of the fence and actually sort of coordinated this entire process and. Um, so I'll give a big thank you to her stepping out of her comfort zone to, to do this. I don't think she knew what a fence was before we started this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in case you're wondering, Meredith, who helped us through the, she came to the plan commission. So the plan commission members saw her, but Meredith, who helped us through our master plan, our 2040 master plan, and then our bike and pedestrian plan from Vanderbilt Associates, she will be the person who uh, essentially is doing our community development work. So she's very familiar with the plan. She helped us write it. And then Elias, who worked here for a little over a year, um, part of the time as an intern when he was finishing up his master's and then for a little while after that, before he went to go work for Vandewall, is actually going to be the person that Vandewall puts here about 10 hours a week to handle a lot of these, these permitting questions. So we're getting two people that already know the city. So the onboarding will be, uh, will, will be I think, a lot easier than if we had to bring in new people that knew nothing. So... All right. So first, can I get a motion to approve the amendment uh, with our of our agreement with Safe Built? So moved. Moved by Alderman Doherty. Is there a second? 
Second. Second by Alderman Gelhard. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Now can we get a motion to approve the agreement with Vandewall and Associates for Community Development Work? I'll move that one. Move by Alderman Schmelzing as our second. Second. Second by Alderman Bailey. Um, any discussion? So I will just bring up this agreement does have a seven day termination clause. That one I'm deadly familiar with. It's in the agreement. So if we don't like the services, it's a seven day termination. I'm hoping we like it. So that's not a, just one. Yeah. Sure. All right. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next is a resolution, uh, declaration of intent for projects to be financed with tax exempt obligations. And I'll turn it back over to Mr. Warwick. So this one sounds very confusing because it is, um, and I'm not a huge bond person, but I'll try to explain this as simply as possible, is that in order to continue our tax exempt status uh, for borrowing in arrears, um, which we complete the projects, then we borrow to pay ourselves back for completion of the projects. In order to continue to that, do that and remain our tax exempt status on the bonds, which gives us lower interest rates, and please correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, Alderman Doherty, that we have to adopt this resolution in order to make that possible. And then on the back of this is a exhibit that we must complete and file with ourselves, do nothing else with on an annual basis. So essentially, this allows us to continue to maintain our tax exempt status for bonds when we do this in the future. We already took care of it for this year, so this will be for our bond issuance in 2025 for the completion of projects that we are doing right now. Just one more piece of paper for the auditors, right? <laughs> yeah, this won't slow our audit down, I promise. <laughs> All right. I've had times with the IRS, I've had to write a letter to myself <laughs> and sign that I got it. <laughs> so these things are not that unusual. <laughs> All right. Um, can we get a motion then to adopt the resolution, please? So moved. Move Alderman Gelhardt as our second. Second. Second Alderman Doherty. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Now, the thing on tonight's agenda that I am the most excited about, because it has taken several months of coming to bring, pulling all this stuff together, uh, you saw I submitted a six-page letter to you all. There is also a resolution for us to consider. Um, we are going to move forward with an official request to the U.S. Postal Service um, on behalf of the residents and businesses in the city of Glendale for a single unitary zip code in the city uh, that would operate out of the same post office as 53217 on North Lydell Avenue. And there, we someday it won't come up that it says the person says, "Oh, you're in Whitefish Bay, or you're in Milwaukee, or that could finally end." That's they fantastic. only ever say Milwaukee. <laughs> is, they used to say Whitefish. When I first moved here, it was Whitefish Bay. It's crazy. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. So there's a resolution before you. Um, the letter outlines essentially. So the U.S. Postal Service will review a request for zip code realignment. Um, once every 10 years at a request. So we get one shot for 10 years. So we made sure that we got all of the information in here. Their only thing that they will look at is the efficiency and effectiveness of delivery of mail. So that's why the first three and a half pages of this letter are how all the ways that they've screwed up our mail delivery. So, so they can see that there are so many reasons why we need this. The absentee ballots, when you get dozens of them, they get sent to Milwaukee's central count and we got to send somebody down and pick them up and bring them back when you have dozens of them that come in the day after the election, despite them telling us, we don't have any ballots, they've all been delivered. Um, we've had, um, there'll be copies, uh, there's a whole packet of things I'm gonna be attaching behind the letter. We have scans and scans and scans of envelopes of people mailing their payment to the Glendale Water Utility, and it, it gets returned to them with the yellow sticker on it that says, address unknown. Like it went through the sorting system at the post office and they don't know where the city hall is. And the city hall has been here for 70 years. Um, there have been, um, there was a letter that was sent to city hall by the register of deeds. They got returned back to the register of deeds. Uh, it was in response to a CSM, but we have copies of that as well. Once again, it says indicates address unknown. Um, we have so many problems with delivery in 53209. Um, that post office operates out of Teutonia and essentially the, the workers all work four very long days and then they get two days off. Like I live in 53209. I get mail basically four, if I'm lucky, five days a week. Um, because when my carriers, my carrier is fantastic. When she's on, she's on, I get mail. But when she's off for the day, I have no idea if they're ever going to cover her shift. 
Um, 53217 has far more regular delivery of mail. 53212 has fantastic delivery of mail. You ask all the businesses in the 53212 section, they get their mail five days a week. They, granted, there's no Saturday delivery to businesses. But um, so we've we've documented and outlined all of the different ways in which they, the, the reasons why they should act on our request to create a single unitary zip code for Glendale that will improve mail delivery, effectiveness and efficiency of mail delivery. Then we added in all the other reasons, all the reasons the things or zip codes are used for that aren't the postal service to sort of boost our, our claim even more. So the postal. Milwaukee tax issues, the fact that if you live in 53217 and you own the same cars I have, you pay 30% less for car insurance. Hey, than man, I pay. that's what I'm saying. For <laughs> yep. I live in 53209. I pay 30% more. I have so, progressive. They're like, nope, we don't do zip plus four. I'm like, come on. Yep. Yep. So uh, we've had so many issues come. So all of those are documented in the letter. There's a resolution. And I think there's about 25 or 30 pages that I have on the back of it that are attached. We, if we approve all this later this week, I will have that entire packet scanned and I'm going to send it off to U.S. Postmaster Louis DeJoy. I've also had conversations already with Senator Baldwin's office, Congresswoman Moore's office, and Senator Johnson's office. I actually had a really good conversation just the other day with Senator Johnson's staff person uh, that I've worked closely with. Um, and so I think we're going to have a really positive reception from the members of uh, our representatives in Congress. So there's two ways this can go. The first is it goes to the U.S. Postal Service for review. Um, once the U.S. Postal Service conducts its review, which can take anywhere from six to 18 months, um, we will get an answer. If we don't like the answer that we got, the next step is an act of Congress, where we basically go and we ask our two senators and our U.S. representatives to submit a bill on our behalf. Um, and to create a single unitary zip code. This basically goes into one of those categories, like if you ask them to rename a, a post office building or a federal government building, they just go through a very a, a different process, um, but they would essentially direct the Postal Service to create a single unitary zip code for Glendale. So we've got two, two lines of attack. The first one is to go through the formal process of requesting the review through the Postmaster. Yes, ma'am. So um, this is not to unify the the zip code it's to give us a brand new zip code like, it will create a brand new zip code for the city of glendale city that will glendale. be the city of glendale's and what often when they do this so many smaller post offices have a single zip code so if you go to the one that's on lydell in your district it says milwaukee wisconsin 53217 and so that's all that's out of there is 53217 if you go over to the one on Teutonia, it says milwaukee wisconsin 53209 on the building what we're requesting of them is what often happens in a lot of larger cities where you go into New York City and there'll be one post office, but there's five or six zip codes that are handled by that one post office building. We're asking them to take the building that already exists in the city of Glendale, and it will be 53217 plus whatever zip code they assign to Glendale. So Whitefish Bay, Fox Point, Bayside, River Hills will still get their mail out of 53217, and all of Glendale will come out of that building, which means that on an election day, when Megan sends a request and says, are there any ballots, we'll send somebody over to pick them up, they can't say, they won't have accidentally sent them to Milwaukee, because they won't have been through the Milwaukee post office, and you know they won't be able to say, oh, we don't have any, um, because if they have them, that's the only post office they could be at. One of the issues we've had is City Hall receives its mail from Milwaukee in 53209. And but, so everything gets sent through Milwaukee and never doesn't always make it here. One other question. Why would we ask for a I'm just asking, why would Jessica, we there's somebody in the waiting room? So um, sure. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, why would we ask for a different zip code? Why wouldn't we just say add it like five three two one seven to everybody in Glendale? So Glendale has enough properties with the 13,500 people plus there's about 7,000 properties in Glendale because of all the businesses. It is large enough to justify its own zip Okay, code. that's what I wanted. Okay. Right. And then we also don't end up with the confusion that 53217 now is for six communities that <laughs> we still have. The, what's a default to in a database, right? That's the other thing is that every time. In theory, it's a new number. In theory, it will be a new number. Yeah. <laughs> Which will then you need to speak into the microphone. Is it their decision? It will of yes. either if they give us a new um, area code, I mean, uh, zip code, or extend it that all of Glendale is one zip code. Yeah. So okay. they will. Our request is for a single unitary zip code. 
However, when the post office evaluates, they're going to look at what would be the most efficient and effective way to guarantee much more regular mail delivery and much more consistent mail delivery in the city of Glendale. Yes, they could dump us into 53217, or they could create their own zip code for us and just have two of them operate out of there. I would venture to guess that based on the population size of having all of you know, five of the seven North Shore communities in one zip code may be too big. And so they, they're likely, because remember all of Whitefish Bay isn't in 53217 either from Hampton South is is in 53211. So there's already Whitefish Bay is already divided up too. So yeah, the, the and then Brown Deer is in its own zip code. Um it's not in with 53217 either. So it may just be that that you know we'll, we'll have to see what they choose to do. Okay. So other questions. Alderman Schmelzing? Yeah, just I, I just did a look quick look up because I never really thought about how they stratify the zip codes. Um Glendale is very uniquely shaped. So I, I think they may have some recourse to say that they can't like zip down Port Washington Road and just deliver the mail in that fashion. So I'm just curious how we can plead our case to mitigate that. Because I, I totally agree. It, it we, we have a lot of these postal issues because of the city, you know, municipality split. But at the same time, we have to be ready when they come back and say, well, these are all square big blocks centralized by a post office. That would be the reason. So I think you brought up some good points, but I don't know if we're addressing that portion of it. And, and those may be reasons that they give, but you, right. the, the re, one of the things that the tax issue, the sales tax issue with Milwaukee brought up and made so evident to me is that that was entirely a zip code related issue. But the way in which we had to frame this case to the U.S. Postal Service, it is not about the, the sales tax issue or the car insurance issue or the other things. We had to basically acquire all of the data that demonstrates that they are not providing good regular service to the city. And specifically, it is the division between 217 and 209. 209 service is where the problems are. In terms of the neighborhoods it services, in terms of getting mail to City Hall through 53209 because the post office is in Milwaukee. And so, you know, I had conversations with folks at, at Senator Baldwin's office and Congress Moore, Congresswoman Moore's office. Um, and they their their recommendation was very clearly make sure what you are focusing on is how to improve mail delivery in the city of Glendale, because that's the only thing the post office cares about. They don't care about all the other ancillary reasons that zip codes are used for. Right, right. In the same way that like your driver's license, you can use it to get on an airplane, you can use it to vote. It doesn't just mean you can drive a car. The DMV doesn't care. They're going to say, you can drive a car, here's your driver's license, right? They're, they're not going to look at all these other things. The same thing with the post office and zip codes. Yeah. Just a question that'll come up as other I run into people will be, okay, this happens. So my driver's license has got to be renewed right away? You know, it would have a wrong zip code. There, there will there will have to be an, a transition period and an education period. Okay, cool. It won't all... It I, won't I, be I, just... I assume so, but I'm just, I can picture somebody running up to me and going... You know what's going on? So, yeah. Good. Um, I do have one. Is oh, anybody? I'll, I'll oh, go hard next. But yeah, I got a list going. So I, I think that what we, what we should be pushing for here is that we that Glendale have the five three two one seven zip code. That's what I think should happen for all the reasons that are in this letter that you want to because all the bad things are happening in five three two one nine. All the good things are happening in five three two one seven. Let's ask them to, to you know to make us all five three two one seven. That's what you know. So to answer that, here's the problem: if we make five three two one seven too big with too many addresses in it, then what they're likely to do is take Glendale and the rest of the North Shore and create two zip codes. And it's going to be like Glendale and River Hills and Bayside, Fox Point and Whitefish Bay will be another one. And the idea here was to keep it focused on just specifically what the city of Glen, what would benefit, most benefit the city of Glendale. Well, so, I can tell you, all, my constituents are in 53217. And, and right. we're not, we don't want to change. We don't want to have to, you know, change our envelopes and change our return uh, labels and all that business. Uh, and I, I would think that uh, it would benefit the city that that we adopt the five three two one seven. Now maybe you know with the plus four you can add something that that would be just Glendale specific. Uh, but yeah, I mean personally, I don't want to change it to a, a different zip code than five three two one seven. But the point though is, there's only nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine plus fours you can add to five three two one seven. If they've already been maxed out with all the properties that exist in five three two one seven, then their next step would be, if that's what we requested, their next step would be to say, look at Glendale, look at Glendale five three two zero nine, 
look at the rest of these other communities in 53217. You can't lump the rest of Glendale into 53217 because it creates too many properties uh, for the plus fours. And so then they might just create two new zip codes for the North Shore or make half of it 53217 and the other. So the idea here was, I, I understand what you're saying. I understand it's there's going to be an education period and there's going to be a bit of an inconvenience, but I think the long-term effect for the city of Glendale is actually going to be better. And I think that so the post office is more likely to do something that doesn't max out the plus four numbers on their on the zip codes. Yeah. Uh, no. I have, I think I'm the only district that has all three in their district. I am five three two one seven two um what is it two 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 one two two one two and oh nine. So at least some uniformity in one district, which is one aldermanic district, will help because I have all three. And um, the Sprecher area is five through two hundred nine, and then go a little, and then just south of everything, just south of Glendale Avenue is five three two one two. And then I live in five three two one seven. Yeah. Even though I really like that one because it's really inexpensive insurance, but <laughs> I, I, I feel like well, I've I have a feeling that based on you know, Glendale's crime statistics, if we had our own zip code, we would all be able to enjoy that same insurance. I don't care about everybody. I'm yeah. not just kidding. But all right. I think it is uh um I, I hear what you're saying, um, Alderman Gelhart, but there this is gonna be a bigger thing than just changing because even if we did stick to five three two one seven almost 40 percent of my district would have to change too so or over 50 because it's only a small portion of district one that it um any other questions comments okay can i get a motion then to approve the resolution and the letter so moved move alderman bailey is there second about alderman vukovic any further discussion Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? No. Please don't vote no. <laughs> if this doesn't go in unanimously, I'm afraid that they're just going to throw it out. I'm I'm okay. going to ask you to, before I call and say the vote is, con is considered, if this isn't a unanimous resolution from the council, I'm afraid that the Postal Service will not look at it. And I got that advice actually from our elected representatives. Sorry, go ahead. Comment. Wouldn't we have a chance whenever they come back with, we could still talk or ask, go to the centers and do something else if we thought it was different. But if we don't do anything, we're never going to change. And they're not going to change on their own. Right. Because for them, they're happy with however the mail service is working. We're not. So I think we ought to go forward, try to get something back from them. And then we can debate at that point if we're going to complain about what it is. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't have any problem with my, uh, the mail service. And I, I'm not... You know, my constituents haven't been unhappy with that either. So that's why I said I think we should be pushing for five three two one seven throughout the Glendale because that seems to be. The I would prefer here. that myself too, but I'm saying is the bigger evil is to try to get this all into something. Right. So I would shoot for that first. So, right, and 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 I'm asking for. So I've not yet called that the vote is finalized. Again, the reason I'm asking you, John, is that if. If, if this is not a unanimous vote, do we send off to them? And I'm asking you to think of the whole city, the city as a whole, um, in this particular case, because if we don't move forward, if we don't move forward with the unanimous vote, um, I don't believe that the post office is going to take it seriously if the entire if the entire city leadership was not behind it. So I, I'd, I'd be happy to, to vote yes if we modify it to say, you know, we're, we're asking for 53217 to be the Glendale zip code. I mean, that's. That's what I'm asking for. May I say something? I, I'm five three two one seven, but I think it um, Alderman uh, Gelhart. Sometimes this is affecting the whole city. I know it's one district, but it's my district who has three. There's other people who have five three two zero nine and just five three two zero nine. There is your one district. I think who has five three two zero nine and just five three two zero nine. They might like to have theirs at 53209. I think it's the greater good of the city of Glendale this time. It's not um it's not gonna change like the landscape or how people live or, or or anything like that. So those are the things that I usually, you know, go to the district and say, look, this is on you. You decide because this is your district. And I will usually vote with it. But on this particular thing, it's for the greater good of Glendale. 
And and just looking at the maps, it looks like five three two one seven is actually pretty large geographically. So if anything, I, I think that request is going to be dead on arrival because it's going to create probably eleven to twelve thousand properties within five three two one seven, and there aren't enough plus fours to accommodate that then. And so, you know, they'll just deny it and send it back to us. But asking for a single unitary zip code is what our representatives have said is most likely what would be considered. And so, I mean, I guess- Or do we postpone this and then you can talk to more people? If you're not gonna, get, if we're not gonna get unanimous, we might as well wait one more week or month or something. The deadline on this? We don't. I well, just well, you got a 10 year deadline if we screw it up. Right. No, I'm saying. Well, no. If, if we screw it up, if we screw it up, the next thing and then is we need an act of Congress. But if it isn't unanimous, what we ask our our representatives, then that's also not going to go through, right? So it, it has to be it has to be a unified front. So um, if there's so there was a vote called. Uh, I have not yet called that that vote is finalized. So I'm going to ask. You know, um, I guess is there a motion to lay this over to our next meeting? Joanne's also not here, so. Okay, uh, then can you speak into the microphone? So our attorney's giving us legal counsel, but he's not. Uh... Yeah, a couple things. You can ask for unanimous consent. There we go. Okay, a couple of things. First, you can ask for unanimous consent if you want. If that's the will of the body, you can do it that way. But technically, so we did have a, a motion and then a second. So there could also be a request from the individual who made the motion for unanimous consent to withdraw it and then hold it over the next meeting or whatever just so we there we go just so we have it in the minutes because technically someone could say well you had a you had a you had a motion and you had a second and you started voting on it and then there was a secondary motion to put it over um but if there's unanimous consent if everybody's on the same page with that you can just undo it all right so i'm going to ask um who who made the motion and who seconded made by Bailey and seconded by Vukovic. Um, are you willing to withdraw your motions? Yes. Okay, so motions now have been withdrawn. Okay. What? Well, no, I mean, the, the thing is if the second, if the motion and seconded don't get withdrawn, then this is basically, then this is the moot point. We, we just wait, I just wasted months of pulling together research because if this doesn't go in unanimously, um, I can guarantee you the Postal Service is not going to consider it. So, fine, fine. All right. So it's been withdrawn. Motion's been withdrawn, and the second has been withdrawn. Um, so at this point, can I have a motion to um, uh, lay this over to our next meeting? Make the motion. Moved by Alderman Schmelzing. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Doherty. Um, it's been moved and seconded that we lay over the request for review from the Postal Service for a single unitary zip code in the city of Glendale to our meeting to be held on June 10th. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. This has been laid over to our next meeting. One abstention. Okay. Um, the last item and on our agenda for tonight is an ordinance. Um, so the state passed a, uh, a state statute that during the Republican National Convention, closing time for liquor serving premises is 4 a.m. instead of 2 a.m. And um, if for municipalities that don't, it's automatic. The closure is at 4 a.m. But municipalities have the option of saying, no, we won't do that if they're going to have events going on for the RNC. Uh, it's actually the recommendation of the city administrator and uh, welcome to Glendale and even the chief that we uh, that we basically do not approve the ordinance tonight, that we just let the, allow our, our establishments to be open until 4 a.m. And actually, Beck is here from the chamber representing many of those businesses as well as the hotels. So, Becca, can you just tell us what you heard from folks, please? Yes. And to fix those minutes, we're discovering the North Shore now, not welcome to Glendale. But Sorry. Yes. It's okay. Um, so I actually have been working close with Carl, um, and I actually contacted all of our restaurants and bars in terms of like, would they even be willing to stay open? Like, is this even a point to bring up? Um, they all feel the same way that this is like an economic impact that we cannot lose on. Um, 
pretty much the Bavarian Beer House and Old Heidelberg Park with the beer garden said, if there's money to be made, we want to have the ability to be open. Sally's Grill said he's looking into staffing more because he wants to stay open. Sprecher Brewery wants it to be an option, even though they let me know that because they're the oldest Milwaukee brewery, they technically don't have a closed time in there. Some laws, uh, they made a, Sherrod made a point to kind of tell me that. Um, so I'm here on behalf of Sherrod as well, because he was going to be here tonight and he couldn't come. Um, the Brick said that they don't have staffer like to keep the kitchen open, but they would like the option to have their bar open. Um, Bistro on the Glen is the only one that didn't get back to me. Um, I didn't ask Bayshore because I feel like Bayshore might, I would have to have a separate meeting with Brenda before I go to her restaurants, just to kind of respect that command. Um, but Holiday and Riverfront also said that they would keep their bar open. Uh, we do have over 500 hotel rooms, depending on one of the hotels and how many rooms they can have at that point. Um, and pretty much all of them are booked, except for Residence Inn is holding about 30 rooms right now because they plan to price gouge uh, at the last minute. Okay. Not price gouge. Um, the Opportunity. Yep. Surge pricing. Surge pricing. Yeah. <laughs> which is, which is, um, however you look at it, good or bad, depending on tax dollars. Anyways. Um, but we're expecting over 45,000 people to come to the city. A lot of our hotels and a lot of municipalities around us have actually decided not to stay open till 4 a.m. So I think this could be an even more bigger opportunity for us. Um, I will tell you that a lot of our venues like Sprecher, Bavarian Beer House, Holiday Inn, they have gotten contacted by delegates or by people to host events there, but they want to know if they are able to stay open till 4 a.m. before they sign the contracts. Um, a lot of the meetings, I've gone to all the RNC impact series, is, they have told us that this is something that you'll regret. And I've sat next to some of the other municipalities where we've been there, um, that we're expecting a $200 million direct indirect impact in the Milwaukee County um, and even beyond. Um, and it's to promote, you know, our small local businesses to help them. It brings, you know, enhanced tax revenue to our businesses, um, job creation. Uh, they're looking into the transit system right now to keep the buses running later. So personally, I feel like this is an opportunity that we shouldn't kind of look past because of the economic impact that it can have. Um, so I think it should really be considered. Um, but really, even with venues, we've had our building where we're in now, the RNC has looked at some of our office spaces to like host things or hold things. Um, and some of the realtors in the area have told us that they've been looking at different buildings to host things in, and they're not gonna sign contracts until they know for sure that the 4 a.m. So I don't wanna also push this aside and wait. I think we need to kind of make a decision on this so that we can get the biggest economic impact at all of our venues, restaurants, bars. And I did talk to Carl about this, that um, Discover the North Shore would have those businesses sign contracts because we are planning on doing like bags and informational packets at all the hotels of all of our local businesses to try to get them to, you know, spend their money where they're staying. And so it'd be nice if we could put something together of the different venues that are staying open that late or the different um, bars so that they know where they're coming. Cause at all the RNC impact series, they said that those people will not get out of the Pfizer until about 11 PM. Um, and then it'll take them about 30 minutes, depending on traffic to even get back up here. So then you're only giving them an hour to have an event and then kick people out. So I just think it's really imperative that, you know, common council kind of thinks about it in terms of it will be a huge benefit. It'll be beneficial to all of us, not just the hotels, not just the venues, but also the increased taxes, the increased um, awareness of Glendale on the map. Um, so that's what I'm kind of here today. And it's Monday through Thursday, so it's a weekday, um, but this could really drive a lot of business. I believe though that the, the time is from Sunday to Saturday, right? It's the entire week of that week. The actual stuff happening at the Pfizer is just Monday, uh, the 15th through the yeah, 18th. The state statute for the 4 a.m. I believe is for the entire week. Correct. Yeah. And I even was put in the portal like Clutch Park and different parks like Rem Park is in the portal now for potential use for private events if the RNC wanted to do some kind of speaking thing um, and do private events. So it, it kind of just is up to what codes or ordinance you guys have in different areas for decibel level too. Um, Cause I know with the Bavarian beer house grounds, 
certain, there's a certain decibel level that we have to cut off Oktoberfest at a certain time. Um, so that'll all play a factor in it. But I know that um, Josh from the beer house has been very adamant. Like we need to know before we sign these contracts and tell people they can party here until 4 a.m. Three of us up here have been to party conventions before. And, and yes, like it gavels out sometime between 11 and midnight and then transportation, they'll have shuttle buses. But if their shuttle buses are sitting in traffic downtown, they may not get back to their hotel till one o'clock. And so that's why these events typically, they're also pre gavel events that are, you know, in the afternoons. So, um, so yeah, it really, it does make sense. So the, the request here from staff is we have an ordinance. There's one of two ways we could go. It could be moved and seconded and then voted down. That would be the staff's request is that it be voted down or we, the other is that I can call for a motion and it could fail for a lack of a motion. Um, so if we're gonna follow the staff recommendation, I can ask for a motion to adopt the ordinance. Nobody says anything and then it, it dies for a lack of a motion. Um, and then we just, at that point, we're subject to the state statutes and we're not asking to be excluded from it. So are there any questions that people have before we move in one of those two directions? Yeah, go ahead, Becca. I'll say one more thing. I will say there's been a lot of negative press on cities that have um, decided to close early. Yeah. So there's a lot of articles that'll go out as soon as you guys put the minutes out or different things like that. Um, I've seen it with Shorewood where business owners are getting really mad because they didn't you know, either they didn't hear that they were part of it or they didn't know what was going on. Um, and like the comments online are very disheartening. So I just wanted to put that in your ear too, that like there has been some negative publicity on, you know, communities that have decided against staying open. I appreciate you taking the time to do the homework and come and tell us what our businesses think and that unanimous, everyone that you spoke with, all of them that responded yeah. said they wanted to stay open. Carl, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say it might be more definitive if we actually vote this down so that it can be out there that this, this, the Common Council took action on this. Okay. Well, then I got to ask two people who are going to vote no if they'll make a motion in a second to adopt the ordinance only to vote it down. Um, so I guess it, that's why it could also, for a, if there's no interest, we could say it was put before the council and no one moved to adopt it, which means nobody wanted to support it. That's another option as well. So, and the minutes can reflect that. Okay. All right. So um, we have an ordinance before us that would designate 2 a.m. as the closing time for all of our beer, wine serving establishments and restaurant establishments during the time of the RNC. Um, there's a recommendation from staff that we not adopt the ordinance. So is there a motion to adopt the ordinance? It can also fail for lack of a, of a motion. All right, hearing no motion and no second, uh, the ordinance fails for lack of a motion. Um, so if the minutes could indicate that no one was willing to move the adoption of the ordinance, please. You want me to communicate that with the businesses since I'm already in communication with them on getting their feedback on this? Would the Common Council like me to tell them yeah. it was to lock in those contracts now. Yeah. <laughs> and get these people to spend their money here. Yeah, it was 4 a.m. is no one was willing to uh, to move adoption of a 2 a.m. closing time. So 4 a.m. is the closing during the RNC. Are we, one quick question. Have we done our um, newsletter yet? I can't remember. Um, No. And when does it, it goes, the summer newsletter. There's three of up. them. There's what, February, June, and November, so the, I think, or something like that. I would definitely put this in the June um, newsletter to let the constituents know that they're going to be partying till four o'clock. I'm, I'm warning you ahead of time. You know, this is the DNC and RNC. But, uh, RNC and then we're going to be doing, um, and then try to put a positive spin on it where the revenue is going to help city of Glendale and our um, North shore right. chamber. Um, so, but I think it needs to be put in that newsletter. I think we've got sure. a bunch of our hotels that are delegate hotels. Well, is it three or four? Um, it is four delegate hotels right now. Okay. And then the other, the La Quinta that's closer to like where the Holiday Inn is, they're completely full. Obviously the other one is yeah. confusing. Um, but even the Motel 6, Rebecca, their GM told me that they're completely sold out already. Oh. Here, if you're not going to stay downtown where the rooms are six or $700 a night, your next best shot is Glendale. Yeah. And we're five minutes down the freeway, so. All right. 
So that, that concludes all of our business for this evening. Um, we now go on to commission, committee, board, and staff reports. So I'll uh, start with the city administrator. I was just going to mention there's a police commission meeting on Wednesday. Um, they will be a closed session item to interview internal candidates for the soon to be vacant chief of police position. All right, city attorney. So the Wisconsin Supreme Court heard oral argument on the use of uh, ballot drop boxes. And it looks, I don't know, you never want to read too much into the questions during oral argument, but if I was a betting man, I'd bet that those are going to be back. Um, so buckle up. This is just the beginning of the legal saga that's going to be coming between now and the fall. But uh, I, my guess, it, it should be interesting to see how quickly they turn that decision around. Um, they've taken less cases in this last year or so than they've ever taken in their history. So shouldn't be too, you know, they should they should get that decision out one way or another sooner than later so that everybody can prepare, but stay tuned. Thank you. Um, police chief, how, how many days, how many tea times do you have reserved for June? And are we invited to join you to golf at I any point? I have a lot of tea times for sure. <laughs> oh, yes, you can join me if you would like. So uh, you, uh, you do pay, right? If you, you yes, have any. Oh, okay. if you all show up? <laughs> only if you beat them sure, yes i walk though so there you go um not, yeah, nothing else to report thank you again for everything i've really appreciated everyone on this council um it's it's been a real joy and it's it's nice to be able to go out on everything and um my last day is may 31st we're planning on having something here from uh one to three thirty. Uh, we'll have some snacks. So hopefully, I and Mayor will have to get together before that because you'll be out of town. But My daughter then, graduates at ten a.m. that day. Yeah. So, <laughs> other than that, uh, hopefully, you guys can show up. I'd love to see you. So, yeah. Number one. Um. I, I, um. I would caution Glendale to, or not caution, but really pay attention in the next couple of days, because. Um, I think a decision is going to be made about us having a special election. And that will be June 30th, possibly. So um, for the Senate seat. Also, we don't go till the end of the year without a senator. Um, which is devastating into itself because um, they're already collecting for the end of the year. So whoever becomes our senator has to run for what? that seat at the same time, possibly, and I'm saying possibly because it may or may not be announced tomorrow, but um, running, collecting to run for the seat to finish off from uh, July 1st until the end of the year, which is, I mean, until January 5th or 8th or whatever the date is. So um, this is a, I think this is an idiotic thing. This is just my opinion. It's a cost to, even though I understand we don't have a Senator from now until the end of the year, but they're not in session anyway. <laughs> and the Senator still has staff. And then she, we, we do have, I have used our Senator's um, office to get information and still, um, they're not in session. Um, there might be a, a, you know, a call to session every maybe, but I think it's a waste of of tax dollars to have somebody who may be just doing this job for between now and January, and then we might have a whole new senator from January to the, you know, for the next four years. So, I think we have to watch that. Make sure. Um, just pay attention because we will have to make sure our constituents know because this is this affects all the city of Glendale. Thank you. Number two? Nothing tonight. Number three? Nothing this evening. Number four? Nothing. Five. Nothing. All right. I just have two quick things. The ICC meeting was held in Glendale today. We'll be back again until sometime in 2026. And we only meet 11 times a year and there's 20 municipalities. So um, had an opportunity to entertain all the mayors, the village presidents here. I want to thank staff who did a fantastic job. We had Backlot Pizza did the food um, and then Sprecher donated drinks and uh, Goody Gourmet donated a bunch of little bags of like their specialty popcorn. So um, 
It was nice to have everybody here. Uh, North Shore Fire Department normally meets on the second Tuesday, which will be tomorrow morning, but uh, Chief is going to be out of town. So he asked us to move our North Shore Fire Department meeting to next Tuesday morning. And uh, yours truly will be the uh, president of the board for the next year. We rotated among the seven communities. So I get one more meeting. I get to run for the next year. Um, and uh, reminder, we don't have another council meeting until June the 10th. So we've been almost a month between these two meetings, April 17th to May 13th. And now we don't go again until June 10th. So uh, that concludes my report. And I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh. Yeah. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Schmelzling, seconded by Doherty. All those in favor of adjourning, aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Spaced out. Oh, don't worry. It's all right. I'm going to